couple of men here that I've been talking to in the last half hour, uh, Dr. Kishore and also Reverend Steve Kraft. And I want to welcome you, uh, gentlemen, to WFST. You probably ought to get a little closer, Doctor. Yes, thank you for having us, thank, Brother Jim. Thank you. Yeah, they, they're going to be talking about, uh, Dr. Kishore is going to be talking about the uh, drug situation in the state of Maine, and then uh, Reverend Steve Kraft is going to be talking about the racial problem that we have in our nation. And I don't know who would like to get started. Would you like to get started, Dr. Kishore? Sure. sure. Okay. Um, uh, I'm Dr. Kishore. Um, Thank you for having me on the show here. Uh, I'm in Waldoboro, Maine. Uh, I'm the founder of the National Library of Health and Healing. And uh, we're very happy to be here today to talk about the addiction epidemic that is um, surfacing in Maine in different communities. And we, we are on a tour of different uh, communities here. Um, we've been in Saco, Maine, Waldoboro, and we're here today. Um, and we'll also be in uh, two other communities. Uh, Holton tonight, right? Holton tonight yes. at 7 p.m. at the Tang's Chinese Cuisine and at the Governor's Route Restaurant. One, Route 1, North, on North Street. Route 1, North Street, and uh, also on in the Governor's Restaurant at uh, uh, Main Street in Pasqual Isle at 9 a.m. tomorrow. So. So you want to just tell us a little bit about the epidemic in the state of Maine? I don't think a lot of people realize this. I mean, we go day to day walking, seeing people, but we don't see behind the scenes. Maybe you could just tell us a little bit about that and maybe some uh, incidents or whatever. Right. Uh, I had a chance to meet various people here uh, formally and informally, including the governor of Maine. I began to study the epidemic here. It's national. It's not just uh, located in Maine. It's national. Uh, I like the state because there is a strong enforcement arm here. Uh, there is a will, political will at the top that hopefully will help us uh, stem, the, stem the epidemic, turn the tide around. And I like the communities which are conservative, uh, family-centered, which is my practice fostered. So uh, I felt this is a place where we can show some results in a quick way. And I'm seeing that the numbers are uh, unfortunately going up. Last year we had uh, 286 people who passed away from overdoses. This year the number is supposed to top 365 to 400. So the numbers are not coming down. For each overdose case we see, there are probably 10 other overdose cases we don't see. There are probably 100 cases that are uh, on their way to an overdose or some sort of an adverse event. There are probably 1,000 people who are dibbling and dabbling and 10,000 people who have no concept of what's happening in their own communities. Um, so we have an educational mission. We have a mission to help the people in crisis. And we have a mission to help the, uh, the leadership in communities how best to do things. There's a lot of mi misinformation about addiction and addiction care. The current concepts are there's no wrong door from the Washington DC I mean uh, from the federal government uh, when you don't have a proper solution uh, they foster any solution as a solution uh, so the solution that I proposed is there's no wrong door addiction is a disease people do what they have to do condone them number two uh, medication replacement replace the illegal medicine with the legal medicine which is uh, dispensed from uh, government uh, sponsors uh, dispensaries. It's called methadone, suboxone. They're the two mainstays for the for the federal government, which is what, of course, is imposed on the state state leadership. And the third thing that they're fo they're promoting is um, Narcan, which is a safe shot. When a person overdoses, bring them back to life. They use another medicine. And if this fails, you know. Them, uh, put them into um, some sort of a rehab programs and asylums where people can stay for a long period of time. This is an expensive process, it's a broken system, it's not a working system. We have to correct it, we have to save our children. Addiction is a young adult disease, young adults are the most at risk. So they are the ones who are uh, harmed at the, from, a, from the puberty onwards, age 12, 13. They, 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 once they use the first uh, drug, then they 
escalate up and there's no stopping till they hit the stone wall so that's too late that they have broken lives broken bodies broken minds spiritually devastated to put them together is, is a job and a half you need a lot of work to put a person back together so we got to do primary prevention safeguard our youth which is the future of the country the backbone of the country is the young people they got to take care of the uh, elderly and they take care of the families so we need strong youth how young now are some of those uh, individuals that get involved in some of those drugs what's the age uh the there the, the age groups are dropping in olden days you know 1960s 70s people who did drugs were right after they graduated from college or during college and then they um um went on to use in a controlled way for a while before they uh hit the brick wall and then they sought help usually most people sought help in 60s 70s and 80s and in the 30 late 30s 40s but now the age groups have dropped down to uh high school kids or younger middle school even so and the drugs are more powerful than the olden times when people smoked marijuana means is two percent pure nowadays with the new farming techniques the marijuana is 25 percent pure uh, tetrahydrocannabinol which is the active ingredient so it's a huge amount of uh, uh up escalation in the dosages and they are hitting the kids at a very young age in their puberty and there the, the dynamics are different the body is still growing the mind is still uh learning so the their ability to learn is affected they develop symptoms like ADHD they they're given more medicines by the doctors so we have a unending saga where one medicine leads to another medicine leads to another medicine leads to another medicine and this is not a working system you know I was thinking as you were talking there too I mean the young people seek those drugs but they're searching for something aren't they and what they really are searching for is Jesus but they don't realize that and uh, that would be the fulfillment but it's just interesting how that people go those ways and uh and just go to some pl- something that kind of dulls their mind and makes them maybe uh satisfied for a little bit but then they run right back to the beginning again but if we get a bit truth to the bible uh, i bet that turns them around huh very well put very well put i think uh they need the um the litmus test is not what uh, other humans tell us what the bible tells us they need to go through that what is the you know true word and without that i think um, they're searching seeking there's a hole in their soul they can't fill it except fill the void with drugs and alcohol and you know chemicals i got a question to ask you too why in your uh thing here biography a little bit what is a medical mafia the problem is um we we have doctors we have 2.4 million doctors in the country in my society american society of addiction medicine there are a couple of thousand doctors people who are board certified are few and far between and this society controls the addiction policy in the country basically um and they went towards the harm reduction which is easy solution uh, harm reduction means medicating the people which is easy come to the office take the prescription go live a life um they don't go beyond that uh, similar to if you have a cough or a cold you go to the doctor get a cough medicine and you don't see him again for a few 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 weeks or months so they adopted the same uh, philosophy as a commodity human beings is a commodity you come in you get your needs met you go away unfortunately addiction is much broader than that there's a biological issues there there's psychological issues there there's social issues there there are more important spiritual issues there unless you do a wrap around service involving all four domains you won't get the results and the medical establishment does not like that where you have just like you have separation of church and state they don't want people to talk about the spiritual issues in a practice and unfortunately if you don't do it in a continuum of care you've got to continue the care all through the uh, four four domains if you don't get the results 
Well, we're talking to uh, Dr. Kishore, and uh, you're going to be working in Maine now a little bit. Out of Waldeboro, is that right? Yeah, that'll be my base. That'll yeah, be your base. Yeah, that'll be my base. And you traveling be... through the state, maybe? We want to establish uh, parallel centers, mm -hmm. uh, libraries of health and healing, which is a neutral, neutral meeting place. Yeah. Families have a lot of questions. Doctor, we don't like what, what's being prescribed to my son. What do I do? We need a place where they can get answers, where we will have information specialists who can dig up the right information, cut through the chase in terms of uh, literature. Much of the medical literature is not trustworthy right now. It is sponsored research by the drug companies that sponsor the research. They get the results they want. So they control both ends of the matter. They control the money spigot. They control the doctors who are writing the articles. And then they promote it widely in the press. So that's how the medical so-called mafia works. Uh, they control all the information mm -hmm. outflow. But we need to cut through this chase. So the library is a good place to start, and we set, we're setting up these specialized libraries, hopefully all across the Maine, to be a resource for the communities. Okay, well, we, uh, this is interesting. I, you know, I don't think many people realize how severe this is, but we know that young people, I mean, I, was, I go back to when I was growing up years ago, I was in an area where really there wasn't a lot of Christian people, but we had good moral people. People knew right from wrong, and they, they didn't go off overboard, you know. But I think in the 60s, when they took prayer to school, that was only the beginning and the downgrade. And our nation now is so against the Bible. And isn't it amazing how that everything the Lord has for you and I in that book is for our good? And yet people don't want that, you know. It doesn't make sense, does it, huh? Not understanding. So, uh, Dr. Kishore, appreciate the things you're sharing. And uh, so you're going to be, you're, going to, you're living in Waldemar. Now you're working in Massachusetts, right? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, you were there. You were there. Yeah, I were yeah. there before. Yeah. Uh, I had, you know, practices there. Yeah. And so for various reasons, they were shut down, and you know, we re re-establishing in the Maine, so, state so of Maine. You, so you must have had a lot of contact with uh, young people back back in Massachusetts. Quite a bit. Quite well, a bit. Yeah. 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 Okay. Doctor, uh, I mean, uh, well, you are a doctor, aren't you? No, no, I, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm an sorry ordained, about that. I am an ordained minister, yeah. Uh, yeah. ordained with the American Baptist Churches. My name is Reverend Stevie Kraft. I live in New Jersey. Uh, to give you, um, uh, Jim, a little bit of my background, I am 73 years old. I grew up in a black Baptist church, so I, I always, I've always known that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. But I was a backslidden Christian. And as a result of after I came out of the service in 1966 out of the United States Army, I had a lot of hatred in my heart for, for people of, of different persuasion uh, because of the racism that existed at the time. And as a result, I had that spiritual hole in my own soul. Uh, having grown up in New Jersey, I had easy access to New York City, only being 35 miles outside of New York City. I got involved with my first cousin, who I looked up to with that negative peer pressure, uh, Jimmy Van Dyne. We had a nickname for him. We called him Jimmy the Weasel because he was a master burglar and he also was a junkie. And I looked up to my first cousin, Jimmy the Weasel. And as a result of hanging out with him in the South Bronx, I got involved with narcotics. But it didn't just start with narcotics. It started first with smoking cigarettes. Uh, I had a lot of hatred, a lot of bitterness, a lot of anger in my heart because of the race issues at that time. And it went from smoking a pack of pell-mell straights a day to drinking Gypsy Rose wine and Arriba wine. And from there, from smoking marijuana, smoking reefer. From there to snorting reef, uh, heroin. And from there to skin-popping heroin. And from there to mainline heroin. I look at this problem at the taproot, which is, a, which is spiritual. Uh, it has, like Dr. Kishor just mentioned, it has physical aspects, it has social aspects, it has political aspects, it has economic aspects. But at its root, uh, drug addiction, just like alcoholism, yes. uh, is a spiritual phenomenon. And until we deal with it from a spiritual perspective, we're never going to see true results. Amen. And I deal with it as, as such. I was a drug addict from 1966 when I came out of the United States Army to 1976. I had a 10-year run following my cousin doing burglaries, uh, 
doing uh, pickpocketing on the subway, uh, doing uh, larcenies, writing bad checks, forgeries, all these type of things. And it wasn't until, even though I knew I was called to preach the gospel, I rebelled against that, even though in my heart of hearts I knew what I was doing was, was wrong. But at the same time, being in New York, being in that fast life of New York, having that bitterness and hatred in my heart, having that all that same spiritual hole in my soul, I knew that unless God intervened in my life, I would have died with an overdose and ended up going straight to hell. Mm -hmm. So what happened to me was after years of shooting dope in New York, one night my cousin and I, we get on the subway, 149th and 3rd Avenue, we take the subway downtown, 125th, 8th Avenue, we walked across town going toward the Hudson River into a shooting gallery. For your audience that does not know what a shooting gallery is, that's a place where junkies congregate to shoot dope. We go in this shooting gallery. My cousin Jimmy the Weasel, he takes a hot shot, overdoses, and dies right then. Back in those days, there was no Narcan. He died right in the shooting gallery. The other junkies took him up on the roof, up on the, uh, the roof of the building, threw him off the building to make it appear that he went up on the roof to mainline dope, went to a nod, and fell off the roof. But in fact, he was dead in the shooting gallery. Uh, I left, didn't shoot the dope because I knew that the dope was, was a hot shot. The devil then told me, you got to get out of New York. You better go to the West Coast where no one knows you and you can get your life together. Well, that was a lie from hell because the same junkie that was shooting China white smack in New York was the same junkie that went 3,000 miles west and was shooting Mexican brown smack. I get out there, I start the same thing over and over again, and then God says, I've got to uh, prepare a great fish for Stevie Kraft because if I don't, <laughs> the death... <laughs> <laughs> the devil would kill me. So uh, I ran west, but the devil, the, the Lord bless, blesses, blessed the Lord. He had a great fish prepared for me. I went down on a beach one night in uh, Venice Beach, California, where all the drug addicts and the alcoholics and all the hippies used was back in the 60s. So I'm well aware of that time frame. And I, I, I shot what was called a speedball, which is a combination of heroin and cocaine. I drank a pinch bottle of rum. And I smoked a joint of angel dust, which is PCP, and I blacked out. When I woke up, I found myself buck naked in a straitjacket and didn't even know how I got there. I found out months later after I came to myself and repented that the devil told me when I was on that beach while I was under that blackout, take your clothes off, get naked, and walk out into the Pacific Ocean. And that's, somebody saw me walking buck naked into the Pacific Ocean. I could have drowned. I, I was under the influence of these drugs and this alcohol. I could have been swept up in the undertow and could have drowned. Somebody saw me, took me to the, uh, the Camarillo State Hospital where I stayed in there for one week where God dealt with me and that was my wake-up call. That was God dealing with me. And From that day in 1976 to the day I sit here in your studio, 2016, I never got high again. And now they don't do work in you, did they? Huh? Amen. Amen. <laughs> the fear of the Lord yeah. is the beginning of wisdom, amen. but fools despise knowledge and sound instruction. Yes. And I got married a couple years later, 1978, been with the same woman ever since. We've been married now 38 years. And I went to Bible College, uh, Central Bible College in Springfield, Missouri. Finished that in 1993. Then went to Harvard Divinity School, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Completed that in 1996 with a Master of Divinity, then became a prison chaplain working in a maximum security penitentiary in, in uh, Jefferson City, Missouri, the old Missouri State Penitentiary, renamed Jefferson City Correctional Center, where I began to share not only my story, but working as a chaplain for the government, for the Department of Corrections in Missouri, helping men walk through some of these issues, because drug addiction starts in the heart, works into the mind, and then works out. And the Bible is clear on these things. The Bible tells us that drug addiction, the Bible doesn't label it drug addiction. The Bible's term for it is sorcery. See, there was a man in Acts chapter 8, Simon the sorcerer. He bewitched the people with witchcraft by using uh, uh, potents, by using a substance, by using drugs. And the people thought he was some great thing. Simon was a drug dealer. He's right there in the Bible. The Bible also tells us that in the book of Revelations, chapter 9, that it, as we get closer to the return of the Lord, wicked people would get even more wicked, and they would not repent from their sorceries, from their murders, 
from their thefts and from their fornications. What does that tell us in Revelation chapter 9? That murder, which we see, which is tied at the hip with drug addiction and drug, and, and, and drug sales. Sorcery, which is the actual uh, pharmacia, the dealing and using of narcotics. Fornication, the sexual piece of, 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 of fornication, adultery, homosexuality, transgenderism, and theft. All of these things tie together because as we come to the end of the age, we're going, we see God moving us toward his eternal kingdom while at the same time we see the devil trying to pull people in deeper into the kingdom of darkness. What people have to understand and recognize is that we need, as Dr. Kishore just said, we need a holistic model. The holistic model has to, at its tab root, for your listening audience, has to start with the spiritual. Because and then it has to move into the physical and in these all these other areas. But without the spiritual, where one understands and recognizes that at its root, drug addiction is a spirit. It's a spirit, and the spirit's name is sorcery or witchcraft. And until people understand that and begin to deal with this phenomenon as a spiritual problem, they're never going to be able to get free. Look, I really appreciate you sharing that. You know that you had quite a conversion. Yes. You know, the Lord just got a hold of you and changed you. Well, I think of that verse, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Creation. Yes. Exactly. See, I was religious and one of the hard, uh, up until the time I got saved. And one of the hardest spirits to break is a religious spirit because I grew up in the Black Baptist Church. I knew the gospel. But I had a religious spirit, so I thought, well, hey, I know right from wrong, and Lord, one day, I'll, re I'll serve you, but not now. <laughs> because we know, when we understand spiritual reality, Jim, we understand that we are spirits that have a soul that live in a body. And the, and the Bible says that the flesh always is at war and at enmity against the spirit, and the two cannot coexist. So we have to each day fight against these spiritual forces that want to destroy us. Okay, well, you know, I appreciate your time. We got a couple of minutes. We're down. The time went fast. And uh, um, you want to you, you want to share something, Doctor? Yes, I'd like to share something. Uh, Reverend uh, Stevie Kraft, of course, has uh, done great exposition of uh, what's needed to stay sober, uh, stay in recovery. Uh, at the same time, you know, the crisis is affecting the young kids. We'd like. Uh, people to know we are under the auspices of the Camp Constitution that we are here today and Camp Constitution is an interesting place. Our belief is that uh, every child is precious and every child has to be protected and brought up the right way because we see them as the future of the country. The, the camp has um, um, starting July the 2nd 2017 to July the 9th 2017 it, it holds a get-together at the Toa Nipi and uh, in Ridge, New Hampshire. So we want people to be aware of it. This is where they can learn a lot more about uh, what needs to be done in this time and age. Yes, and for your listening audiences, those that are available tonight, uh, uh, Friday, November 18th, which is tonight at the Tang's Chinese Cuisine, 60 North Street, Route 1 in Holton. That'll be at 7 p.m. And tomorrow, Saturday, November 19th, at the Governor's Restaurant, 350 Main Street in Presque Isle at 9 a.m. in the morning. Listen, it's been a joy talking to both of you, okay, Dr. Kishore and uh, Reverend Stephen Kraft. And uh, I appreciate I wish we had longer to, to talk, but uh, our kind of time is limited. But God bless you, and if we can help you in any way, please let us know, okay? Thank you Thank for having you. us. Uh, we're going to go to uh, uh, sponsor.